Thank you. Appreciate that. I need to remind me to thank my mom for writing that. That was really good. Perfect. That was really good. So uh, I, I typically work within the fair industry. This is my first foray into the Florida festivals and events. Suzanne's been trying to get me here for a number of years. But since y'all's dates are typically earlier in August, and I'm usually out at the OC Fair in California performing one of my acts. So a show of hands just real quick. How many of you, be honest, have never heard of me, never seen any of my content online, you have no clue who I am? Raise your hands. All right, that hurts, just a little. <laughs> All right, that's cool. So quick background then on me. I do entertainment. My company provides entertainment for the fair industry and for corporate events. I created an attraction six years ago called Conjurer Fortune Machine. If you've ever seen the movie Big, it's like a Zoltar machine, only I get in it and I pretend to be a robot. <laughs> and people are like, wait, that's a thing? <laughs> it is, so I do that. And then my wife and I have just started rolling out a new attraction called Play With Giants, which has got giant games and cornhole, a lot of like what we've been playing out on the patio the last few nights. Um, so that's where I fit into things. And about 18 months ago, I decided to start sharing what I'm observing of digital marketing trends and where they line up in the fair industry. So to get started, you'd mentioned I was a magician years ago. I haven't performed magic in many years, but I'm going to attempt to do something right now, and I hope it works. I've, got, I've written down on a card um, a little something. I don't want to show it to you just yet. What's your name? Erica, I'm going to have you hold on to this for me. Don't open it. Don't show it to anyone just yet. You hang on to it. Um, so real quick, guys, start letting me know what are some of the most important things in marketing. Just start shouting things out. Accuracy. Awareness. 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 Content. Consistency. What? Consistency. What else? What about um, what? Brand activations. activations? Good. Okay, so I've got um, a pack of cards here. Um, before I show them to you, uh, what's your name? Azim. Azim. Uh, name a card for me. Just any card in a pack. Jack, jack of what? Clubs. Jack of clubs. So we're going to go ahead and pull out the jack of clubs. I'm going to set it there. On the back of these cards, I've written what I believe are some of the most important words to us as marketers and different types of advertising that we can do. So, of course, I, we've got TV. These are more traditional here. Newspaper, print, billboards. Not my favorite card. <laughs> Banner ads, definitely not my favorite card. We got emails, website, ROI. Everybody know what ROI is? Return on investment? Okay, your CPM, that's your cost per thousand views. Sales, coupons, Groupons, social media, Facebook, etc. All these different things matter to us. But right now, I want to focus on what the most important word to all of us is. The most important word is what I've written down in that envelope. Erica, would you open that envelope? And would you read out loud what that says? And here's Azim's Jack of Clubs. Attention. The most important word in marketing is attention. Is attention. <laughs> Look, I got the trick. I actually did it. <laughs> yes, it still works. Attention, guys, is the absolute most important thing to all of us in marketing, because regardless of how cool your product is, whether it's a cool watch or your t-shirt, your lucky socks or your festival or your events, no matter how awesome they are, before you can tell people that they're awesome, you have to get their attention. And so there's a couple things you need to know about attention. There's three styles of attention, overpriced attention, appropriately priced attention and underpriced attention. Now, how many of you in here are working with a multi-million dollar marketing and advertising budget? That's what I thought. So, which of these is most attractive to you as a marketer? Underpriced attention. So the important question for you is, where is the attention, where is my customer's attention, and where is it underpriced? Okay, so let me take a step back here and give you an example of what underpriced looks like. Since we're here in Florida, this is a pretty good example. And having previously not only worked for Disney as an entertainer, but as a cast member back in 2000, here's, a, here's an analogy for you. So the year is 1964, and several shell companies have begun purchasing land in the swamps of central Florida. 
Walt Disney owned those shell companies and he's purchasing the land. Anybody know how much it was per acre? Walt's purchasing his land for about $80 an acre. Near the end, now think about that. How many of you would like to buy land in Orange County right now for 80 bucks an acre, right? So that's what's going on. He gets towards the end of it. People are starting to try and, and ask questions. Newspapers, the Orlando Sentinel, people are going, who's buying all this land? These six or eight different companies. Word finally gets out that it's Walt Disney. The next day, the acreage went to $80,000 an acre. This is what underpriced detention looks like. So to bring this back to 2018, it's 2018, guys. But right here, it's 1964. The attention on here is cheap, just like Walt's $80 per acre. But the big guys are coming. Walt's moving in. And when the biggest brands in the world, like Mercedes and Pepsi and Unilever and you name it, start putting appropriate amounts of money onto these platforms, then we get priced out of them. So the land grab is now. The land grab is right now to be on this. So let's take a look. I'm gonna do a quick survey here real quick of the audience, because um, I wanna contrast what our beliefs are as marketers versus human beings. And this is kind of interesting. I love this every time I do this. So raise your hand if as a human being, when you're at home, you watch television on your own time. So you watch Netflix or you do streaming or HBO Go or DVR. Raise your hand if that's you. In other words, you watch it on your time, not when the program airs. Wow, everybody. Okay, now if you happen to have DVR, raise your hand if you fast forward through every single commercial. Wow, everybody. Now, how many of you and your brands, and your, your festivals, pay big money to put out a television commercial? Commercials aren't really even getting seen. This is why television is overpriced. Television works. As I'm going through this presentation, please don't mistake me for saying that Facebook's the only thing, it's the only way. I'm not some kind of like Facebook ninja or digitalist and that's how it has to be. All I care about is where is attention and where is it underpriced? So for example, in Facebook, I've started hacking Facebook because I'm honestly on my pages, like for the Play With Giants game that we just started the, the page a few, like a month back, I only have 80 followers. I only want to get up to about 200. I don't need a million followers. I need like the right 150 to 200 fair managers and entertainment buyers in my industry to be following it because then it makes the ad product much easier for me to say, send this out to the people who are fans, who like my page and their friends because fair managers are friends with each other. So there's a built-in hack on your end because I'm doing it B2B. Your end when you're going direct to consumer, Facebook's gonna provide you underpriced attention. Let's talk billboards. How many of your events have billboards? Raise your hands. Cool. Now, of those people, full disclosure, I know a lot of times some people get a billboard where it's an in-trade deal or you get radio ads where it's in-trade. If it's free, mazel tov. That's the way to go. But if you're paying for billboards, now let's, let's contrast the behavior of us as human beings and the behavior of um, us as marketers. So billboards, when you're driving down the street, what is almost every passenger in every car doing? They're looking at their phones. They're driving, they're not looking up at your, but let's be honest guys, most of the drivers are looking at their phones. <laughs> yes ma'am, you got a question? Right. If they were on choke points, you still get, but unfortunately the, the outdoor company, whether it's Clear Channel or Citadel, whoever's selling you that, that board is not gonna charge you based on the, the choke point and the time of day. They're gonna charge you for the whole thing even though your attention's only over here. That's where I, when I say billboards, television, that they're overpriced, you're paying for all of this, you're getting this. Whereas Facebook, you're paying for all of this and you're getting all of that. But let's talk billboards a little bit more here for a second. How many of y'all been, obviously you're in Florida, you've been to Disney World? Yeah, right? 
So I used to work for the company back in 2000 on the college program. It was an amazing experience. They come around the country and they tell all these college students, you can come work in the most magical place on earth and it's going to be awesome. And you get there and they're like, here's your pan and broom, sweeps and trash. <laughs> Happens. But in the process, you get to take some really cool classes and I started to understand Disney's model. Disney's model for billboards, especially around Orlando and when you're coming down the turnpike, is not designed for everybody in Orlando to be like, oh, I should buy, go buy a ticket. Disney's model for billboards is one more touch on the, uh, an interaction with the consumer before they get to the park. So if you think about where Disney's billboards are placed, where are they placed? What's that? Close to the park, not, only, not necessarily in proximity, but on the way to it. So if you're driving into the state, let's say you're coming in from Tennessee or Texas and you're, you're driving your family in for a vacation, you start coming down the turnpike, you start seeing Disney billboards. Are those designed to sell that person on a Disney vacation? No, because they're already on their way. They're already bought in. Disney believes in their model that they're there, and I want you guys to think about this in, your, in the digital space, Disney believes that their guest experience for a Walt Disney World vacation does not begin at the turnstiles, which they don't actually have anymore. They got magic band things, but still. Their interaction, their experience with Disney begins on the website six months out, nine months out, when they go to say, which hotel are we going to stay out, which, which park hopper package do we want? And then you've ordered them, and they come in this box that is completely posh, it's got your name printed on it, and you're like, oh, this is cool, and it adds to the experience. Then you get on the plane, or if you're driving, you, f you drive down, you land at Orlando Airport, you go get on the bus, they take your bat. Everything's easy. They remove friction for their guests. And then as you're driving in on the bus, those billboards are not designed to sell you. You're already bought in. They're designed for you to go, hey, mom, look, 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 there's Mickey. Oh, there's the fireworks. Oh, I can't wait. That's what they're for. So for Disney, it works really well, okay? So let's, um, let's talk about removing friction in the digital space. How many of you do online ticketing? Okay, most of you, excellent. This is, see, if I, when I ask this in the actual, at, at fair meetings, usually it's less than half of the hands go up. This space is, is more advanced, thank you. My, my thing with, with fairs and online ticketing is this, I hate waiting in lines. And whether it's a fair, whether it's a movie theater, I do everything I can on my phone. I mean, think about it. With our technology, as long as you've got a smartphone, a passport, and a credit card, you can go almost anywhere in the world. But you can't go to the county fair or a local festival without standing in line for 40 minutes waiting for a ticket. That does, there's a disconnect there and it doesn't make sense. And honestly, in the fair industry, we're still trying to get people to even consider online ticketing. Guys, in five years, you want to know how, it's going to, how people are going to come to your event to buy a ticket? Hey, Google, buy me tickets to the Strawberry Festival. Hey, Google, buy me a ride band for the Southwest Florida Fair. That worked five to eight years, and that will be at scale. I don't, did you guys see a couple months back, Google did their demonstration. The video went around Facebook like wildfire of their, a, of their AI, their, their smart assistant. The haircut thing, yeah, where um, you basically, the smart assistant, you would say, uh, I, schedule me a haircut for next week. You know, hey, Google, schedule me a haircut for next week. And Google's going to call the salon, and, the, and Google's going to talk to the salon. You're not going to do it. The person on the other end has no idea that they're talking to a computer. And yet, we are in a, in a place where with three types of adopters of technology, early adopters, late adopters, and forced adopters. We have a lot of, an outdoor, the outdoor event space in general, a lot of late adopters, and that puts us all at risk. Let's talk about the power of social media over the internet, okay? This slide comes from Nick Borelli's presentation yesterday. I stole it from him. <laughs> I did not ask permission because I'm, I'm straight gangster like that. So this kid, anybody here have a, a kid in their house that's like 12 and under? Anybody ever heard of him? Yeah? So this kid, Ryan, does toy reviews, OK? So Ryan's toy reviews have generated almost 20 billion views. <coughs> How many views have your videos gotten? Mine get like 80 or 100. This kid's generated 20 billion. He's between 10 and 20 million dollars a year in revenue. He's six. 
And all of a sudden, all of us are looking at each other wondering what we're doing with our lives. <laughs> but here to my point, we live in 2018 and the internet itself with smartphone technology and these built on top of the internet and the apps, the six or eight apps that go on this phone built on top of that is a complete miracle. The middleman has been cut out. This never should have been allowed to happen. This should not have been Ryan's toy, toy review channel. Whose channel should it have been on? It should have been Toys R Us's channel. And they should have been the one to produce this show where the attention is. Instead, they decided, nah, people still want to come and stand and look around our stores because apparently they didn't get the memo that there's this company called Amazon. That shouldn't have been allowed to happen. Think about this. Uber should not have happened. Who should have created Uber? Taxi, Taxi mirrors. Enterprise Rent-A-Car, they should have created Uber. What about Airbnb? Should you and I have just been able to go and deal with this ourselves? Hyatt should have created that. Hilton should have created that. That is the power of the digital space that we currently live in. It is massively, massively important that we wrap our heads around this so that we can really succeed with our businesses and that our businesses will survive. So, um, I just want to get, I guess, to wrap up the thesis here, I really want you guys to understand just the massive importance of what we're doing, of telling our stories. Major, major companies are going out of business. Multi-million and billion dollar companies are going out of business because they are not telling their story on this device. We need to tell our stories on, on this device and we need to do it with great regularity. If we are not doing that, Anyone in this room, whether it's me as an entertainer, whether it's fairs, festivals, if we're not telling our stories on this device and communicating it with regularity to where the attention is underpriced, we will become irrelevant. Got it? Thank you. Everybody's like, wait, is he done? No, he's not done. No, he's not done. Cool. So we're going to start, uh, we're going to go into creating some content. By the way, this, I know we had like an hour 15 for this, I think. I, initially, I thought that we were between 50 and 60, so I came down here with that. So is anybody, if I end up finishing a little bit early, is anybody going to be offended? No? Okay. Trigger warning, I might finish like 20 minutes early. <laughs> so let's talk about creating great content. Anybody know, have uh, any examples off the top of their head of videos they've seen that create great content? Huge. Off of Huge. The Kiki, you guys know what the Kiki challenge is? Okay, if you don't get on Instagram and look up hashtag Kiki challenge, basically Drake, who's like one of the most massively successful selling artists on the planet right now, there's a song of his called In My Feelings, and somebody somewhere along the way decided they were going to jump out of their car while this song was playing and do this little dance to the song and it became the Kiki Challenge. And people literally, like out, I was just out in LA for the OC Fair, literally jumping out of their cars on the frickin' interstate <laughs> as if LA traffic isn't bad enough doing this little dance. But it became a very viral moment. Now, luckily I think Kiki Challenge is waning. Like literally in like three to five weeks, it, it was pretty much done. Thankfully. Thankfully, right? So, but to her point, a great thing you guys can do for content because as, as brands, as festivals, events, as entertainers, I, we're always looking for like, what can we put out that brings value to our, our viewers? And so the Kiki Challenge is a great example of something that's timely, where you can get in on something and do something funny with it and you've got a piece of content built. Anybody else, other ideas on content? I'm gonna share a few really amazing ones with you here in a minute. Yeah. I work at Lion Country Safari, and we did one with the rhinos. Oh, while yeah, the rhinos. Out. And that, there's I saw it. Shares. We have over 100,000 views. And yep. now I see there's one, I haven't really looked into it, but with the shark, and it's a silly one, like baby shark, mama shark. And we don't have sharks, but I was thinking to get the hedgehog, and for Shark Week, we made a shark fin, and I was going to do it. It's really it's silly. Funny. But anything to, like, catch on to what's trying Yeah, anytime, if you can ride, like, most of us, our events are not going to be, are just, 
are not going to have something that is just so amazingly impressive that it goes viral. And I get asked, one of the questions I do get asked, hey, how do we create a viral video? You don't. <laughs> you do not get to have the audacity to decide that your video goes viral. The public, the marketplace gets to decide, which is one of the most wonderful things about social media and the time we live in. Guys, I know there's a lot of stuff out there, the politics and it's the Russians and it's Trump and it's Hillary and it's this, there's so much negativity that goes on out there on the internet. But I will argue this, we are now living in 2018, the greatest time for anyone to be alive, especially if you are sitting here in the United States of America. Because if you were a musician, 20 years ago, if you wanted your song to be a hit, there were six or eight old white dudes that controlled the music industry that decided, no, 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 not you, this. Like, what if I told you Michael Jackson's greatest hit never got onto radio? Because some record producer went, no, no, these 12 songs, these 20 songs over here are out. Now it doesn't have to happen. The reason people like Drake are blowing up is because Drake, put, Drake puts out a new song every week. It goes out on SoundCloud, it goes out on Spotify, on YouTube, it's everywhere. And the cool thing about putting that content out is now instead of having some fancy record producer make the decision, now we make the decision as the consumer. So if you've got a product, you can put it out. If you want, if you want to sell a t-shirt, a watch, these guys, the watches I own from Original Grain, they started on Kickstarter five years ago. It was two brothers. One of them was reti just retired from the Marine Corps, and they were like, we want to do something cool with like wood products on a watch. They went to Kickstarter. They didn't have to take VC money and give up a por portion of their company. All this happens because this technology is now here. It is waiting for us to use it. If we're not using it, then we're, we're idiots. It's there. And so if you want to promote your event, man, Facebook, is Facebook's the way to do it. It's so cheap. Before I get into all that, let can I are you guys ready for like a couple really like mind blowing? This will melt your brain how good these videos are. I'm gonna show them to you. And full disclosure, I did not create any of these, but my god, I would have loved to. And it's not for whatever reason, it's not doing real well integrating with the presentation, so I'm gonna dump out and just click on them here. So this one comes from the Stanislaus County Fair. They're um, a 10 or 11 day fair in July in northern, like north central California. This is the best fair commercial ever. July 10th through the 19th. Yeah. Yeah. That was, they did a second version of that that was done on the carousel. So you can imagine it looked um, quite similar. Um, so, actually, I was going to show you. What's that? Please tell me the next one was on America. Yeah, it was on a carousel. <laughs> and it was the same thing. Now, this one, here's one thing where, um, I'm going to show you this next one in a second. Here's one thing where Stanislaus did really well with that, okay, in, in segmenting out. And I'm going to talk about segmentation here in a couple minutes. So the other version they did of it was on the carousel. What was the, what was the race of the people in this video? They were white, right? So the next one was very multicultural. They had African Americans on it. They had other people involved in it. Because why would you do that? Because do white people go to your fair or your festival? Yeah. Do African Americans go to your festival? Yeah. Like, it's okay to include different people and be open to an entire community. That's what we're there for.
You know what I mean? Like, and I've talked to fairs about this and some, some smaller fairs that have just started doing commercials. Like, honestly, let's think about what we do as human beings, right? African-Americans, a lot of my African-American friends watch BET. Why? Because they're the stars of it. It reflects them. Like, don't we look at things that reflect who we are? So let's, when we're creating our ads, do things that reflect who we are. Speaking of reflecting who we are, Los Angeles County, they did this one like 12 years ago. This year, there was a whole series of them, like four or five different ones. This reflects who their community is out in Los Angeles. Mom, I really like that. Cute. What's it made of? Wool. Like from a cow? Uh-huh. Duh, actually, all wool comes from a cow. Does cashmere come from a cow, too? Take that off. Uh-huh. The boy cow or the girl cow? If there's any place that could really use a county fair, it's L.A. It's a boy cow. Oh, okay. oh you mean the one with the, with the tusks? <laughs> the L.A. County Fair. <laughs> <laughs> Fine. They did one of the other ones in that series. They're at the fair. It's the same girls, and they're at the fair, and they are eating cotton candy. And the question that the mom asks is, she goes, this is, uh, the girl says to the lady at the, the register, this is cotton candy, right? And the girl goes, yes. And then mom says, is that a protein or a carb? And the girl, the gowner's like, it's sugar. <laughs> oh, and I think she says something like, like from a pig? Uh, and it's so, it's very reflective of, it, it, it's playing on the whole sort of LA's very rodeo dry, very fashion centric, disconnected from the agricultural community. It's one of the best videos that I've ever seen. And that's the type of thing that, now mind you, I think this was back in 2004, so virality really wasn't an option back then. But an ad like that today goes, Hog wild. <laughs> Sorry. Oh God, that's terrible. I, I'm going to take a minute and apologize for that one. But an ad like that today will, can easily go viral across the internet. Now, I promise this was like 400 level stuff, so let me take this to the next level. The first video could be a little tricky because of the music licensing. But what if Stanislaus County, who I'm guessing spent in the neighborhood of $10,000 to produce that piece, what if they then turned around and licensed that piece to the State Fair of New York, to the Florida State Fair, to the State Fair of Virginia, to other fair, even smaller fairs or festivals that don't have ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars to produce and deploy a commercial like that, but they might be able to license it for one season for three thousand or five thousand dollars. So if Stanislaus was able to do this, and again, that one may not be the best example because with the music rights and whatnot, you got to go through clearinghouses and whatnot. But what if somebody produces an amazing piece of content that costs them 10 grand, but then over the next five years, they licensed it out to different events across the country and made $100,000 from the commercial. And now they've gotten, they not only have their original commercial paid for, but now they got 90K in the bank. What if that event was one of yours. It could happen. People in the fair industry is real interesting. They tend not they that by the way the the Stanislaus Fair was the award was first place award winner at IFE like three I think it was three years ago. I can't remember when it was. Do you remember seeing it, Randy? It was it was the first place winner and obviously you understand why. I really want us to think about in our content, especially fairs when I suggest this, is that so many of our fairs, our commercials all look the same. Stop me if you've heard this one. The county fair is coming to town, ride all the rides, eat all the corn dogs, have all the fun you can handle, the county fair, get your tickets now. How many of you have seen that commercial? 10,000 times over, we tune it out. We need to tell a story. That fair, the first one of Stanislaus tells a story. What is that story that they're telling? The one with the Ferris wheel that changed, changed decades. Memories, what else? It's been around? Something you can't miss? Generations attend. So it is a, it's literally a legacy ad is what I call it. It plays on nostalgia. That ad has something for everyone in it in under 60 seconds. Whether you're young, so the young, like a 16-year-old might see that and go, oh, I'm going to the date with 
I'm going to ask, you know, the boy asked me out. Maybe I'll have my first kiss on the Ferris wheel like that. The older families are going, hey, we could, let's go ride the Ferris wheel with our kids. The senior citizens are going, I remember when I took you there on our first date. It is nostalgia. Nostalgia sells. If you don't believe that nostalgia sells, ask yourself why there are 300 different X-Men and Avengers movies out. <laughs> it's not for the kids. It's for us because we remember collecting the comic books and being fans of Spider-Man. That's how it, like when Spider-Man first came out, you saw the lines, everybody in the line looked like us. And they were dragging their kids, not the other way around. Because nostalgia sells. Why do you think Disney bought all those, bought Marvel for however many billions of dollars? Nostalgia has real value. So that's a great idea when you're looking to create content is to go with nostalgia. And this for me, this last one is one of the most nostalgic ads I've ever seen. How many of you are baseball fans? Show of hands. Got a number of you. How many of you watched the Cubs win the World Series? Got a number of you. So I'm not a Cubs fan. I'm a Mets fan to my ever-loving dismay. But this ad was easily one of the best baseball ads ever. In fact, maybe best ad ever. Sure as God may green apples, someday the Chicago Cubs are going to be in the World Series. And maybe sooner than we think. How many of you know who Harry Carey is? Beloved, long time, lifelong announcer for the Cubs, and he died before they were ever able to win the World Series. For those of you who are not baseball fans, um, they had like 106 years between winning the World Series, so that was huge. That commercial plays massively on nostalgia. That commercial was not an advertisement for the Cubs, though. It was a Budweiser commercial. People here are like, wait, it was a Budweiser commercial, wasn't it? <laughs> Budweiser, they're masters. The company they use to produce their commercial are masters at creating amazing viral content. And you don't realize it's Budweiser until like the last frame of the video. Like you might see people drinking the beer, but that's like really amazing content right there. Um, so any questions up to this point? Everybody's like, we love Budweiser. Yes, in fact, uh, easily, the, I think Budweiser's greatest video they ever produced. Um, it, okay. You think the puppy? Okay, the can water canning without the puppy. I'm going to tell you which one pulled on everybody's heartstrings was their Super Bowl ad after 9/11. Yes. You guys forget about this one? 
they hitch up the Clydesdales, they go across the, the Brooklyn Bridge, they get out, they're in Newark, they go out and they look across the water, and, the, and I'm even going to get choked up even thinking about it. <laughs> The Clydesdales take a knee and salute the city of New York, right? And that was just like, and everybody, you see the Clydesdales, you're like, this is a Budweiser commercial. And then you see them in New York, and everybody back in, in, in 2000, I think it was the, thing, the 2002 Super Bowl is what they did it for. Everybody knew, like, we were all in a very different place than we are now. And when you see those Clydesdales take a knee, like, people that I know that were like, I hate Budweiser, are like, I'm, I'm a drink of Budweiser. I'm getting like, but, and it wasn't about, hey, here, let's sell our beer. It was about telling a story and communicating their brand message. And I think we as brands get things mixed up on what exactly it is to build a brand. So what is a brand? What do you, what does that mean to you? When I say brand building, what does it mean to you guys? It's your perception. Yeah, and really it's your perception of a reputation. I actually, I was with Randy's wife, at, with Fran at IFE. You might have been in on that one, I can't remember, but Fran was sitting next to me a year or two years back and the whole talk, whole hour long talk was about branding versus advertising. And at the end of it, people were coming up to me and going, I'm just, I'm more confused now than ever. And I said, here, it's really simple. Your brand is your, your reputation and your perception of your reputation. Your advertising is how you tell people about your product. Super simple. Yes? This was years ago, which was like a PRSA conference. So this guy was talking about branding, and he said your brand is your promise. It is. And I'm sorry, what's your name and who are you with? Oh, uh, Tanya Keller, uh, just do with uh, Fort Myers Beach. Oh, got it. Super PR with, got it. Yeah, your brand is your promise, ultimately. Um, it's your reputation. So when you're producing your content and you're trying to figure out how do we build our brand, we build our brands a lot of different ways. It can be through content. And I think that's, as Nick Borelli would say, that's really at the awareness level of the brand. Um, if you want to dig deeper, then you really start to get into engagement with your guests and understanding what your guests, your, con your consumers want. Um, and one way we can do that um, in fa Facebook when we're communicating our message is through segmentation. Um, how many of you boost posts on Facebook? Okay. How many of you use the ads manager? Less of you. And of those of you that use ads manager, how many of you do an unpublished post? I love that I just saw all these faces go, huh? <laughs> so here's the deal. We are wasting in the outdoor event space by not utilizing this feature, the potentially the greatest ad product ever created. It is a gift that has been handed to you. It has withstood now the GDPR issues and Zucks having to testify before Congress. That was really funny if you watched it. <laughs> Congress people going, but Mr. Zuckerberg, how do you make money? We sell ads. <laughs> it was really embarrassing for Congress. Um, so an unpublished post, it's real simple. You, rather than going to your timeline, going to your page, creating your content, clicking post and then clicking boost, once you click post, it's available on your page, okay? So what you rather do is you go in through the ads manager, you create your piece of content, there is a checkbox as you go through that process that says unpublish this post. It used to be called the Facebook dark post, and so what happens is if you have a segmentation of two, three, five, ten, twenty 10, 20 different pieces of content, it allows you to send it out and only those people that fall within your segmentation will see it. So here's the advantage on that. It does, and it won't go on your page. So if you want to push out 20 pieces of content that are specific to different demographics, different areas, people like country music, people like rap music, you can do that and it doesn't clutter up the timeline. So if somebody goes to your page, they don't see 30 different ads because they may not, they're not in that segmentation. So for example, if you wanted to segment out, you could use like segment A or content A here, you have a piece of content that's gonna go out to females between 25 and 45 with children. They may or may not be married and they live within X number of miles of your event. What do we call these types of women? What's the nickname for them? I heard it. They are soccer moms? <laughs> They're soccer moms. So you would think about what type of content does a soccer mom want to see? 
in order to entice her to come to the fair. So there's an idea. Content B, male or female, 55 to 85, they're retired, they live within X miles of your event. So, senior citizens that come to your event or retired folks that come to your event probably want something different from your event than a soccer mom does, than, a, than teenagers do. Or you have a segment like Content C, male, female, 18 to 35, they like rap music. If you go in through the back end on Facebook, you can literally segment out exactly like that. And they also like, so let's say you have, I don't know, you have a rap rapper coming to do, on, uh, do a show at your event or your fair. You, can, you don't only want to target it against the people that like that rapper, but what about people that like Drake or Snoop Dogg or Sabo or 21 Savage, all names that you guys are looking at me going, what? I don't know them. Sorry, I, I was heavily influenced by hip-hop and rap. I went to a middle school that was predominantly African-American and Latino and like 10% white people. And so when I was 12, 13, 14, like rap, it's just, I like rap. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I do. So you can segment it out and you can create different pieces of content that promote those parts of your event to those groups and then only those groups see them. So instead of having one shot, so many events, we have that one commercial we create and we, all our hopes and dreams ride on that and we spend ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 to produce and get it out or more because we put it on television that increases the cost. You can create smaller micro pieces of content that target these three are just examples. You could have 20 pieces of content. Yes? And this is only available if you boost the post. No, not the boost. This is available when you go in through Ads Manager and you create the content and the post in the Ads Manager. So a regular post will segment out with the Ads Manager without having to do paid for ads. I'm sorry? So, so in the Ads Manager, you can do it without actually having to do a paid for ad? Like, are these paid for posts? Oh, yes. You're going to pay, you're gonna pay to push these out. And so depending on where your segmentation is and where you're at, like obviously an ad that's covering, you know, a, a radius of 50 miles that's coming out of Miami is going to be more expensive than one that comes out of Dade City just because there's a million more people around Miami or West Palm Beach. Or, so, yeah, you're going to do them paid. But the unpublished post for uh, I've been going to conventions since 2009. I've been listening to social media talks since like 2011, 12. Nobody talks about the unpublished post. It is the most powerful ad product because you can create this. And here's something cool. On Facebook's back end, you can A-B test something. Anybody not know what A-B testing is? Okay, so A-B testing real quick. It's where you put two very similar pieces of content out. Maybe you change one thing. Literally, like companies will A-B test like on a Shopify page, whether the buy now button is one color or another. And they, so when they test that, they test it for smaller sums of money. And when they figure out, oh, more people buy when the button's red than when it's blue, then they put their higher ad spend on the red. So you can put out a couple different pieces of content for not a whole lot of money and then turn around and put your ad spend out. When you go, oh, this is the commercial that's getting the most traction, you put more money behind that one. So ads manager is absolutely the way to go when it comes to segmentation. Um, any, any, anybody here do, have done that? So nobody had done the unpublished post, okay? Anybody ever hear of the Facebook pixel? Cool, so an ads manager, this is where you're getting the real advanced level stuff. I hope you guys are writing fast. <laughs> the Facebook pixel is a line of code. Google has a pixel also. But basically what Facebook does is when you generate that ad, your account has a pixel, which is a little line of code that you copy and you go put on that landing page. So if you're trying to sell tickets, if it's, hey, here's the county fair, South Florida fair, whatever it is, buy tickets now, they click on it, that ticket page will have the, the pixel coded on it. And what that does, is, so let me give you an example. Um, if I was to buy tickets, I go, I see your ad, because you're spending a lot of money on your ad on television, but right when the commercial comes on, I look down at my phone, so I don't see that. But I'm flipping through my timeline, and I see your stuff, and I say, oh, hey, babe, the, they're doing a two-for-one deal at the fair. Are we going this weekend? Yep, buy tickets. Cool. I click buy tickets. I go, and I look at it, and I go, ooh, I'm not sure which one exactly I want to buy. Let me go ask her here in a minute. And I turn the page off. That Facebook pixel... Every time that person, now that they've gone to the page, if they do not buy, every time they go back to their Facebook page, they're going to see your ad again. Facebook sees 
here was your ad. They clicked to go to your website, but it did not convert. So when they come back to Facebook, Facebook is going to say, here's the ad again. You were interested. Do you still want to buy? Do you want to and it's going to keep showing it to you. Does that make sense? Facebook Pixel, if, and if you, any of this stuff, guys, if you're not sure how to install it, literally, Google is your best friend. How do I use the Facebook Pixel or YouTube if you're more visual? I always use YouTube for my searches. Um, anybody ever hear Purple Mattress? Yes. Yeah, Purple Mattress. So about 18 months ago, I'm looking for a new mattress, and I see this thing pop up on my feed. Amazingly, I search Google for mattresses, and then purple mattress starts popping up on my feed. Isn't that funny how that works? And I'm like, I've never heard of this thing, purple mattress. So I click on it. I watch their video. I'm like, huh, that's cool. I don't know if it's the mattress for me, but that's cool how they did that. Close out purple mattress. I go back to browsing. For the next three months, that ad chased me everywhere on the internet. On Facebook, on their partner sites, their audience networks, everywhere. That ad chased me. That's because the Facebook Pixel was firing. Every time I went in, that's what they call it. It fires. And I was seeing it again and again and again until I finally went to the little down arrow on the ad and said, quit showing me this ad. But that's how it works. So how would you like to be able to sell your tickets online? And then somebody's like, I just need to know the prices. I'm not buying now. But then your ad keeps popping up for them. That's the Facebook Pixel. That's how that works. Questions? I got a couple of questions that I uh, pre-installed here that I get a lot of, but yes, what's your name? Where are you from? Heidi. Oh, Hi, Heidi. Hi. Um, do you have to be a coder to put this pixel code in the website? Um, not usually. Um, like it is a cut and paste, and there's a there's like when I use um, Shopify and Squarespace and a lot of them, there's just a spot where it says insert your code, like on the left, where you just cut and paste and tell it save. So depending on how your website is, is set up, there may or may not be a, like one extra step. But it's, it, it's really fairly simple on how they do it. Any other questions? So you put that pixel on the page where you're trying to get the sale? Yes, you would put it on your, so whatever your link is mm -hmm. from Facebook, like if it's the buy tickets page, that ticket page is going to have it on it. Okay. And if you, any of you guys, if you're doing online ticketing, like if you're using Sapphire or Etix or any of that, they all know how to do it. They can just walk you right through it. It's super simple. But it is that little piece of code is magic. It's like they used to be called a lot, long time ago, it was called cookies. And we still use cookies. Like it improves browsing experience so that you're not waiting for every little piece of a website to load. It makes things quicker. But that pixel, and, and Google does a pixel also within their Google. If you use Google AdWords, they'll do it. Um, super killer. And it, it gives you great data about how many people are hitting but not converting so your analytics can get much stronger. Um, other questions? Yes? So, like, what if you're selling multiple items? Does the pixel go on each page that of um, Your pixel is going to go, because I did it when I sell t-shirts with multiple shirts, it's just going to go on whatever your main page is. So like, it, I mean, you, you potentially could put it, like if you have different pages, Right. Right. So I would just put the if it like again in Shopify when you go into Shopify there's like on the settings menu it's like copy and paste your pixel here and then they code it and you and then it covers everything. So just depending on how your website's set up. Um, you may need it on each page, each sale page, or if you just have a shop, like what are you building on top of? Are you on Shopify or? Um, no, I, I'm, it's just a question that I've always had. Okay, yeah, you can, you, if you use some of these pre-packed things like Shopify and whatnot, then it just covers the whole basis. Yeah. Cool, other questions? Yes, ma'am, what's your name? Hi, I'm Evelyn, I'm with the Yeah, Florida's friendliest hometown. Yeah. I hear those ads in New Mexico, by the way. <laughs> and so a lot of the time, our target audience finds those different places to newspapers. Mm -hmm. Something's up online, still like buy tickets from my small shop, and we'll travel down to squares to get it instead of sure. online. Does it still work engaging in like, Facebook and like, kind of media? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because here's the thing the cost to get it in front of them on Facebook. Is still way cheaper than it is in the newspaper. Now, you like you're where you're at, 
your mileage varies on where some newspapers are hurting so much they'll give ads for just about anything. Some people are still, newspapers are standing on their laurels and saying, no, this is the price. So evaluate that. But as far as, you know, should you have a box office or whatnot? Absolutely. In, in 50 years, there will still be a box office. Like there's always going to be a direct point of sale at the event for the people who didn't get ahead online, didn't buy advanced tickets, didn't. But I just think you want to do whatever it takes to reduce friction to your buyers getting what they want. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Yeah, nice to meet you. <laughs> Interesting. So snaps, Snapchat's actually one of the um, questions that I had pre-packed because I still get nowadays the question used to Yeah, so you got, you got ahead of me there, Randy. Thanks. <laughs> Uh, Snapchat. So here's the deal on Snapchat. It is, it is losing its sphere of influence, but it's still very much worth it. If you want to target a 15 to 25, 20, it was aging up. It was getting up towards a lot of 35 and 40 year olds were starting to use it. Um, and then once Instagram, Zuckerberg bought Instagram, straight stole like a gangster all of Snapchat's best features and people were like, I don't really need to use this. I can just use Instagram. But there is still a large, large group of people that are in that 15 to 25 to 29 demographic that I would, for, I'll tell you this, for the cost to advertise on Snapchat, why not? I mean, I know geo filters are starting to get hit and miss. I still highly recommend doing geo filters. I know Jessica talked about with Sapphire earlier at the Tulsa State Fair, they wanted thousands and thousands of dollars because Snapchat's starting to get wise to where, when and where these events are. So like, I was going to drop one over the San Diego County Fair just as a, as a gift to them, right? And it was going to cost me like 2500 bucks an hour. <laughs> because, it's, because San Diego is like, is like one of the five largest events in the country, and they, Snapchat knows it, and so those dates. But literally, I was like, I wonder what it would be if I just did it on some random Sunday in August when there's no events there. And it was like 20 bucks a day. They know. Like, if you try to, I try to drop one over a stadium. Like, some of the stadiums now are even blacked out. Like, you have to contact Snap directly and negotiate, and they're talking thousands of dollars an hour to do it there. So most of your events, because they're local festivals, they're smaller, like, Honestly, I've been getting, I lost it in February when they, they changed the whole app and I ended up losing some of the, um, people didn't know because they changed the whole interface on the app. If anybody uses Snapchat, you know, back in February, it was like, wait, where did messages go? How do I swipe here? The functionality fundamentally changed. So when that happened, I was putting um, stuff out for the Osceola County Fair and it was like, wow, we were going to like 14 and $18 CPMs because people couldn't see it. They didn't know where it was. Since then, the filters I've deployed, I'm back down to getting like anywhere from $1.50 to 80 cents per thousand views. By the way, try that with television. You're not gonna get a thousand views for a buck on TV. So yeah, geo filters are great. You can still push stuff out with stories. It's great, it's very inexpensive. So Snapchat's still there. And one thing um, I'll share with you guys, if you're ever not sure on apps like what's hot what's not um, if you I don't know how it works on Google but if you have an iPhone um, if you go to the App Store let's see if the Wi-Fi will work you literally when the App Store is open you tap apps and as you scroll down you're gonna get top paid and top free if you tell it see all so I hear people saying oh snapchat's dead but I also see it's the number three downloaded app in the App Store that's data right there. You can flip through there and see which apps are getting downloaded the most. Um, so that's Snapchat. Let's talk Instagram. Instagram is like one of the hottest apps right now. How many of you guys are on Instagram? Right. And how, real quick, how many are on Snapchat? Almost about the same. Cool. Okay, so here's a couple um, hacks for you guys to use Instagram more effectively. Um, on your end, not so much about you pushing content out, but about the engagement, which goes to a deeper, deeper level with your consumer. So this is a search of South Florida Fair. Pay attention, Sienna. Sienna is their South Florida Fair social media guru. Say, hey, Sienna. What's up? <laughs> 
So if you go on Instagram, this should look familiar. These are search results. So if you search your hashtag, you will see everyone who's posting content on your hashtag. If you search South Florida Fair and then tell it places from the search menu, it will bring up a screen that looks like this. I highly recommend that you engage with the people that are posting and promoting your event because that's what they're doing. Give it a like if it's really exceptional. Get in there and say, hell, this is amazing. Um, I was talking to Sienna earlier. Maybe you've got a family that comes to your event that posts, oh, this was the first time he ever rode the roller coaster. Or my son's first time at the fair. He loved it. Maybe you have something in the back of your mind where you message that person and say, oh, so glad you love the fair. Why don't you bring your son by? We've got, we've got a little gift we want to give him. And I don't know, maybe it's a South Florida Fair hat or a something or a, where the kid feels a little extra special and giving a little extra value, right? Understanding what your guests are doing is critical. Understanding your consumers. That's, called, that's when you start playing the thank you economy when thank you goes a really long way. Let me give you an example of how I play thank you economy. So there is a lady who's a fair manager in Florida, who I found out because I connect with her on Facebook, is a huge Motown music fan. I happen to love boys to men. They happen to be, yeah, see, I got people laughing at me now. Hush. <laughs> boys to men's my favorite group of all time. I love Motown music. So right away we have something in common. So I wanted to extend a thanks to her because she had just, she was in the process of getting me locked up for a two year deal. So I wanted to say thank you. So the typical way we would say thank you is literally, hey, thanks for booking me or a thank you card, right? I, or a handwritten note. I don't know why we put so much value on that now. I think it's still, it's still a nice touch, but because I had context on her, this, this two year deal is going to be very lucrative for me. So I go onto eBay and I find a signed gold record from The Temptations. I buy it, I frame it up, and I mail it to her. Thank you for being part of the Robert Smith Presents family. She puts it up on Post-It, and then, and this, oh, by the way, there was some strategy in this. I timed it up so that it was like two or three weeks before the Florida Federation Affairs Convention. I'm at the Federation, we're at the President's party. Someone who had seen it comes up to me and says, hey, weren't you the one that sent that record, that signed record to her? I said, yeah, and he goes, that was really amazing. By the way, now, I don't know if it's worth anything, but just so you know, my wife really loves Brad Paisley. <laughs> Randy, does Fran like her record? Signing on the office in her, in her office wall. That's value. That's building context with you. Now, I'm not saying you should go buy stuff for all of your guests. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But if there's a little something to give back, I mean, li literally, like, Disney gives away stickers by the gadrillions to kids, and the kids think, man, I'm the coolest thing. I've got a Mickey sticker. Like, what's the value you can give that's a little extra for your, for your guests? The other way you can use Instagram, you can use Instagram and put it to work for you for content creation. So if you happen to search um, your hashtag and you see an absolutely incredible photo taken by someone, for example, this was, um, I searched Walt Disney's Magic Kingdom at one point. This photo came up and it, this user is Orlando Brothers. His name is Trevor. And he's got a couple, I, look, I clicked on his username and I looked through stuff. He's got like tens of thousands of followers. He only posts stuff for the theme parks, but uh, clearly he's an absolutely outstanding photographer. And when I say great content, how would you like a picture like this? Look close. That's Expedition Everest. Do you guys see what's going on in that photo? That's cool, right? The roller coaster's coming out of the phone. Who knew that the galaxy had that ability to do it? So that's, uh, that's totally Photoshopped. I figure out how he did it. I do it myself now, but that, like, that's a cool piece of content right there. Very good piece of content that you could use. Um, so again, with Snapchat, we, we touched on, um, social media for B2B. I touched on it a little bit earlier. I, for me on Facebook, I really, I don't want people that aren't buyers liking my stuff. Like sadly, I, I've started auditing who are my followers so that I get a higher conversion rate on my ads going to the people they really need to go to. 
Um, so just to kind of sum this up, we're down to what, like 10 minutes, 15? Okay, I told you I'd get you out of here a little early. Just to wrap this up, guys, we are in the biggest communication shift in history. We have not seen anything like this since the advent of the printing press, literally like written communication when initially communication was on cave walls and then they figured out papyrus that they could take their history with them. That is the level of communication shift we are in. If you're not sure what's happening right now, and I study television production, that's what my degree's in, my bachelor's is in TV production, minored in journalism. Look up what happened in the 30s and 40s when radio transi transitioned into television. The radio star said, no one's gonna buy this giant box with this little black and white screen and watch it. We're fine. And then to quote the song, video killed the radio star. This is going to kill television. I want you guys to start looking at these platforms, Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, like ABC, CBS, ESPN, and MTV. Does that kind of change your perspective on how these platforms should be viewed? They are now the networks, and you can now take your message directly to the consumer. It is absolutely critical that we do it, and that we do it effectively. If we're not doing it, if we're not telling our story for the seven or eight or nine different platforms on this device, mind you, these platforms that for every minute of our attention, take up about half of that minute. 50% of our attention is spent on one of those six or eight social networks when we have this device in our hands. If we're not telling our stories effectively on this device, someone else is going to do it for us. Thank you guys, glad you could be here.